welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Justin Clark. And I'm Matamor Cronin. And today we're talking about the future of automation. And we've had a podcast in the past where it was more about the doom and gloom aspects, about how everyone's going to lose their jobs and how we might get around that. But today we're going to talk more about the opportunities of automation. But first, uh, Matamor, Maybe let's talk a little bit about the stats and what the current state of automation is, and then we'll move from there. Yeah, so the current state of automation. So if you look at the numbers, the most common job by number of employees is retail salespeople. So these are the people that are helping you around Foot Locker to find a shoe or helping you around West Elm to find furniture or whatever it is. And this job is in serious trouble. And there's two words that I have for this, Amazon Go. (laughs) So like I was just in San Francisco and I went into an Amazon Go store and it's truly a magical experience. You scan your phone, you walk in, you pick up whatever you want and you leave without ever having to check out. So this is fairly new. You know, these stores are less than a year old. But Mm -hmm. if you just play this out and how these stores are going to sweep across the nation, any yep. real t- retail salesperson, which is the number one most common job, is going to be in serious trouble. Mm-hmm. So, so that's the first stat I want to talk about. The second stat is the most common job by state. So not by population, number of people, but just the most common job across the most number of states is mm-hmm. truck drivers. So that's right. the most common job in 29 states. And this job is also in serious trouble, obviously, because of self-driving cars. Right. And, um, you know, that doesn't even include all of the Uber drivers and delivery drivers out there. Mm-hmm. So, so in total, a McKinsey study put that by 2030, 800 million jobs are expected to be lost due to automation. And that doesn't even include... Is job. that across the world? No, that's in the yeah. U.S. And that, that doesn't even... Um, or actually, sorry, no, that, that is... I across, think it, that is across the world. Yeah, okay. my, my apologies. Um, but that doesn't include jobs lost to globalization. So, for instance, moving your customer support department to India, for mm-hmm. instance, because it's a lot cheaper there. Um, so these are sort of the big stats about the state of automation currently. And right. one thing that people will say over and over again is that, oh, yeah, we will lose jobs, but new jobs will be created, new and better jobs. And I, we should just spend a little bit of time on this because it's so obvious, but it's clear that this time is different. I mean, if you just look at, for instance, Blockbuster versus Netflix, I mean, Blockbuster in 2004 <laughs> employed 84,000 employees and earned $6 billion in revenue, whereas Netflix in 2016 employs only 4,500 employees and earns $9 billion in revenue. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's good to talk about kind of the, the foundational technology that's allowing for all of these automations, too. So software is software and computers are Eating the what world. is allowing for all of this. So, like, for example, one, one thing that all of us are familiar with are point-and-click website designers like Squarespace or something like that. Mm-hmm. Really what's happening is there's an automated tool that's generating code in the background based on your point and click uh, methodology, like what, however you want to design your website, it can design, it can create the code for you. Yeah. Um, and, and I think the interesting thing with, with programming and software is they're, they're just, it's like the reach is so broad that it's getting to all of these places that you wouldn't expect it to normally reach. And even so, like it's there are tools that automate the software development process. Right. So it's like this this whole meta thing. Like even software development jobs aren't necessarily safe long term because there could be some uh, point and click methods for like non software developers to create right. code or just you know some sort of artificial intelligence in the background writing code for whatever you want to do right because the internet used to be this wild west where Mm -hmm. you just had all of these 
lone rangers who were good at particular things and oh i'll design this website for you or oh i'll mm -hmm. i'll design this this back end architecture for your e-commerce site for you and mm -hmm. nowadays any of the common practices that people have wanted to do time and time again someone's built a software system for that and so that's great for anyone using the software because it's way simpler to build a site on squarespace than to hire an individual developer mm -hmm. who has to custom tweak the code anytime you want to make a change but all of the profits from the industry are being funneled to a much smaller group of players rather than being right. distributed across all of the individuals out there yeah, I think that's why sometimes people argue against uh, capitalism and like a full capitalist society in the in the future of you know where where society is because of how met, how much inequality there will be like we've talked about in the past. It just right. you you start a company when there's this opportunity to provide some sort of automated service, and then once that happens, then it's funneled into the money is funneled into the hands of a few people, like you said, which that's really interesting. Right. I mean, it's such a better situation now if you're a small business owner or an entrepreneur or an individual creator, but it's a lot worse if you're an employee or someone who depends on just getting work funneled to you from an employer. I mean, look that's at, good news, though. That's in a, good in news, a way, yeah. if you're if you're an entrepreneur. Well, I want to make that a theme of this episode because there's a shift in mindset that's taking place. And the person who I've heard it heard describe it best is James Altucher. Have you have you read any of his stuff? He wrote Yeah, uh, I've read some blog blog articles of his. Yeah, so James Altucher, he was a chess master. He started 20 businesses, 17 of them failed. And I love hearing from him because he's really been through the ups and downs. So he made millions, lost it all in the dot-com dot crash in 2000, mm -hmm. made millions again, lost it all again in 2008. And every single time he's made it back, it's because he's chosen himself in, in his own language. So, And every time he had a big downfall, it was because he was waiting for an employer or a company to choose him. And... It's, it's, uh, so what does he mean by that when, when he says choose yourself? What, what yeah. is his... So I guess what, so what he's referring to is the shift in the American dream. So if you think about what the American dream used to be with in the days of Don Draper, and mm -hmm. uh, it used to be that if you kept your head down, worked hard, really focused on a specific trade, whether it's, you know, being a lawyer, being a doctor, being an engineer, being an accountant, whatever your yeah. specific area was, if you worked hard, studied hard, went to college, you'd be able to buy a house, you could have two cars in your garage, you could have kids with a white picket fence, you could send those <laughs> kids to college, you would, you could count on health care from your employer, you could also count on a 401k through your employer, there were unions, this whole paradigm has gone away. It still is there for some people, but it's very far out of grasp for the majority of Americans. And it, the, the key shift is that you used to have to depend on your employer. For instance, let's say you're a musician. You pretty much have to just hope that one of the big record labels is going to choose you for you to be successful. Mm -hmm. Or let's say you're a writer and you want to create your own TV show you used to pretty much have to wait for one of the big channels like CBS or ABC to yeah. choose you. Otherwise, you're not going to be successful. Now, fast forward to today. Anyone can be a world-renowned musician through Spotify. All you have to do is create a groundswell of support, which mm -hmm. you know is harder than it sounds. Or likewise, anyone who wants to be a creative, like a writer or an actor or whatever, you can grow your YouTube channel. And you can become yeah. a millionaire in a matter of weeks if you have a viral video and then you play that virality properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the the hard part of this is people have to wear multiple hats to be successful today. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily harder if you can be a more of a generalist than in the past, but you do need to know how to market your stuff. You do need to right. be able to cre create and market and that kind of reminds me of um, 
the book you recommended me called Perennial Seller oh, by um, Brian Holiday. Yeah, he, he talks about how artists, specifically creatives, need to just they have to grind out this new thing this this new product that's never been done before and most artists and creators just want to stop there and they mm-hmm. they just want to be this creator and that just creates and that's it but he talks about the necess- the necessity to actually market your stuff right. and and get it out to the world and i think that's just a a really important lesson too is like now you need to wear more hats than we would have previously. You can't just go into this super niche area of knowledge and not extend beyond that. Yeah, it's like everyone's a one-man everything agency. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why people like Ben Horowitz, a famous VC who founded Andreessen Horowitz, he loves the hip-hop community because every hip-hop artist, not only do they consider themselves a musician a creator, an innovator, they also consider themselves an entrepreneur and a businessman mm. and a mogul. And they love the aspects of building their brand and creating right. products. And a lot of other creators are very anti-capitalistic where they think it's mm-hmm. almost like a bad thing to try to market yourself. Yeah. So it's going to be key for the people who win out in this choose yourself era that you accept that undertaking and Mm -hmm. that you actually take the steps to to market yourself. Um, I mean, for instance, like, just how much you can reach as an individual is incredible now. Like, think of Joe Rogan. That guy, Mm. he has a team of pretty much two people, himself and Jamie, and he reaches more people in his podcast episode of two people than any major TV show on the planet. More Mm. Bigger than Stranger Things, bigger than you know, anything you, you can think of. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons we wanted to start this pod or not yeah. to have that reach, but, but the fact that with podcasts, you can have these long form conversations and truly hash out an idea. And I think people are just, they're ready for that. They want that. Whereas with TV and the old news stations and whatever else it was, it was just kind of this, these click bites and these, these little video clips of, you know, maybe some author comes on to describe their book in three minutes and that's right. all they have. And well, that's after them being, you know, interrupted a million times by five interviewers. It's just right. a complete nightmare. And you, you used to have to get buy in from the top before you could put mm-hmm. anything out there. Like if your producers or your advertisers didn't like the message you were sending, they could make you change your message. But through podcasting and being a YouTube creator or whatever, whatever else yeah. you can you can create your own rules yeah and one of the things we use too with this podcast and and you've heard ads before is anchor and that's another sort of automation tool mm-hmm. for podcasting it's it's a way to aggregate it's it's a way to send out the podcast to all the different distributors of po- at podcasts um rss feeds and it just it's a tool that helps us create whatever we want to create in a way that that we don't have to spend that much time on yeah so let's let's get into some examples of how you can create opportunities in the choose yourself era or the post automation era so Mm -hmm. let's use podcasting as the first example because that's perfect so let's say you want to start a podcast whatever your passion is let's say you love fashion and you just want to talk about fashion with your best friend once a week and create a little bit of a following for yourself because maybe one day you want to start your own fashion line and Mm -hmm. this was a great way for you to build your audience so you can have that support when you do launch your fashion line. All you have to do, this is literally all Justin and I do, you have a call once a week on Skype, one hour call, you use this tool called Ecamm, E-C-A-M-M, which records all of your audio and video and then at the end of the call, you just, if you want to add a little sound bite to the beginning or the end, you can literally drag it right in there through the Anchor app, the web application. Mm-hmm. And then with one click of a button, it publishes to every single platform that you would want to listen to on podcasts. So Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, all of those. Yeah. And, and the, the key to 
starting out is if you can actually message anyone in your personal network who you think might like it. So all of your friends who like fashion or maybe the, you know, your classmates at fashion mm. school or whatever it is, that's a great way to get some initial groundswell. And then if you just keep doing it consistently, you can build a serious audience and yeah, it's available and, to anyone. Yeah. And another cool thing is you can have a, you can start a company that supports podcasting the same, a similar way that anchor did like all of these trends that we're seeing podcasting is, is exploding. And, mm -hmm. you know, I still think we're kind of in the infancy of that industry. There's, there's so many services that are, that would be useful, like end to end services. And anchor is one of those services that does a really good job, but it doesn't, there are more um, opportunities than what anchor provides. So I think if someone wants to look at these trends, the way that automation is changing the economic landscape, and they can they can actually start a business that supports this transition into a new economic you know place. <clears throat> yeah, and and just to give a couple other examples, so let's say podcasting isn't your thing, but mm -hmm. let's say instead you want to launch a physical product. So I, I actually took this example from one of Tim Ferriss's episodes, which is called the one person million dollar businesses. Mm. And the idea here is that he featured a number of businesses that earn over a million dollars in revenue per year. And they're only one by run by a single person. So this is just the best example of how you can run a high, a, a mm. scaled, super lean business. And one of these is called Tools for Wisdom. You can literally go tools, the number four, wisdom, uh, dot com. And I mean, these are like pretty hideous planners. I was showing, <laughs> I was showing my wife them. And like from a design standpoint, it's like something your grandmother would design. I mean, really bad. And this thing owns, it earns more than $2 million a year in revenue. And this wow. guy, he doesn't, produce these planners all he does is design the covers and do the marketing everything else is completely automated and this guy earns two million bucks a year in passive income so that's that's one example if you want to do more of a physical product um, yeah or like let's say let's say your dream is not to necessarily create an online business but it's to take on a new career like let's say you want to be a professor this is an example from James Altucher, where this guy really wanted to be a, cons a, a computer science professor, but he didn't have the he didn't want to go through the whole like grad school and doing all that background stuff. He just wanted to start teaching. So at his the college that he lived nearby, he just got an open classroom and started posting free computer science lessons around and or, around the campus, and he mm -hmm. started to get a following. And then, you know, after week after week, it started growing and it grew to the point that people were raving about this class and it got the attention of the administrators and they ended up giving this guy tenure as a computer science professor without having wow. any sort of graduate degree or anything because he just chose himself and he just did it. Huh. <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I like that there are other aspects to automation than just being able to code or write software because there are services that provide that like I'm sure some of these one million dollar businesses are drop shipping businesses done through oh, Shopify yeah. or something I mean it's it's automation in a sense that you like it's passive you don't have to touch it and it everything happens in the background but these services are making sure that everything runs smoothly and it's not all software like, there right. are people in in the background kind of working for you and you can set up systems for a business where that's a reality. You can just have it have this whole system working for you, generating income, and you just have to know what's out there and what what tools you can use to automate your your workflows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like for instance, there's this one San Francisco company that will analyze all of a business's practices, and then it will remove like it will determine which people can have their jobs automated away it will fire oh. those people 
and then it will either automate it through software or it will automate it through freelancers. So it'll create job postings on Upwork, hire the right people, manage that relationship, even measure the performance of the various freelancers. And this can easily seem like a dystopian sort of future <laughs> where it's like, oh shit, they really are coming to take my job. It's like, there's it's, no such thing as a safe job. Yeah. It's like Sauron, like the all seeing eye, like <laughs> going to come and analyze me and decide a robot's better suited. But, the, <laughs> but that's only if you look at it from an employee's perspective, if you look at it from the perspective of a business owner, someone creating their own mm-hmm. industry or choosing themselves it's a huge opportunity. And so what's the name of this San Francisco business? I don't, I actually don't know the name of it cause it was Kurtz Gesagt, the, one of our favorite YouTube channels yeah. that was featuring it and they didn't name the company, but there, I mean, there's a number of companies like okay. this. A lot of times I need to look that yeah. up. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've given some good examples. I do think we should talk a little bit now about, maybe the future scenarios, and then we can sort of work anything else we want to talk about into those scenarios. That sound cool? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, cool. So let's take a quick break and then let's get into the worst case, best case, and most likely future scenarios. All right, so let's get into the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. So, Justin, what do you think is the worst case scenario for the future of automation? So we touched on this a little bit, but the worst case for me is this automation is so broad and so vast that it's, you know, it's so good that it generates a ton of wealth. But all of that wealth is concentrated in a super tiny fraction of the population and I just, I worry a lot about this income inequality with um, the rise of automation. But one of the other things that's a little concerned, or, you know, the flip side of that, you know, to kind of touch a little bit on the best, eh, I'll wait for that, actually. I'll wait on the best case. Okay. Um, but, but what would you think for, for your worst case? Well, I mean, I guess just in general, the way that I see the landscape right now is, it's sort of like we're in this respite in between the waves of automation and joblessness because we haven't had a crisis in some time. I mean, 2008 is a long ways away when you think of the cyclicality of recessions. Yeah. And so when the next recession comes, it's quite likely that there's going to be massive layoffs because mm-hmm. employers are now going to have an excuse to either send jobs to other cheaper countries through globalization or to automate those jobs. So Mm -hmm. once this happens, I actually think the worst case scenario is if the pendulum swings too far to the other side too quickly, Mm -hmm. because look, the top 1% of the 1% are very savvy people. And if you just try to like tax the hell out of them right away, you know, they're going to spend millions of dollars on lawyers to find the best possible outcome for themselves. Mm -hmm. They're going to find loopholes. Maybe they'll move to another country. Maybe they'll switch to offshore accounts. It's really difficult to know what the impact is going to be on -hmm. taxes. And some other things that are worrisome to me in the worst case scenario is, I mean, these have been taken down from the, from the website of I think it was like the Green New Deal FAQ website. Yeah. But one thing that they had on there is a guaranteed living wage job to each and every person, citizen, which I think is a complete disaster. It it like Yeah, I was gonna say that that sounds like that could go really wrong. Yeah, well because we don't need everyone to have a full time job anymore. That's the whole reason why automation is is uh that's like the whole trend with automation. I mean In 2018, machines were doing 29% of the work. In 2022, it's projected to be 42%. By 2025, it's projected to be 52%. So every year, where a higher percentage of work is being done by machines compared to humans, and what Mm -hmm. this FAQ was basically stating is that we're going to guarantee that every person has like a 40-hour work week, just like Uh basically pushing pens around and like 
I yeah, mean, that reminds me of what we were talking about in our first automation and jobs episode where we were talking about bullshit jobs. Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> it guarantees bullshit jobs for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so that could be a really bad worst case scenario. I mean, also, if you imagine just like trying to guarantee everything to everyone right away in one fell swoop and then mm -hmm. trusting the government to distribute all of that, all of those resources, I mean... I don't know when the last time anyone went to the DMV or dealt with the government, but they're not very efficient in, just in how they manage no. processes. So my worst yeah. case scenario is actually once the next recession hits, we have this big wave of populism, which passes lots of measures that are too extreme. Um, mm -hmm. And it leads to really bad results. It leads to billionaires leaving the country, so we actually end up with less tax revenue than we thought we than we had previously, and or we, even businesses which generate a lot of tax revenue. Exactly. If you move your businesses offshore, that's mm -hmm. that's a, uh, you know terrible for our economy. Um, yeah. And then having bullshit jobs. So not only are people like you know, still have the same problems they had yesterday with automation, but it's like now they're just wasting their time at this as well. So that's my worst case scenario. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like the, well, okay. I don't like it, but I definitely agree with the whole uh, bullshit jobs problem like that. So this, they were saying like, this is actually part of the law. No. So, so look, to... this was on their FAQs of the, Green New Deal okay. website. It has since okay. been removed. So it was okay, probably good. some early draft created by a staffer or, or okay. whatever. So it's not like this is this is the standard policy, but it does point to a common misunderstanding where you equate security, basic needs being yeah. met with having a job. Like it yeah. is so idiotic to secure a job for every American when we know already that some percentage of Americans just cannot effectively contribute to the economy i mean yeah so it's uh, yeah we have to be careful about that so maybe we get into the best case scenario best case scenario and one of the things i wanted to throw out there before we um you know really talk about our scenarios is the fact that finland just finished a two-year trial of universal basic income Oh, for great. I think it was about 2,000 citizens. Um, oh. the, the results came out Saturday, I believe. So it's, you know, the, there's still a lot more um, insights to be gleaned from this. But basically, it made everyone that got the basic checks, the basic income checks, a lot happier. Um, but I don't know. Oh, money if makes it people happy? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know if it um, helped them get jobs though. Uh, I think huh. there was, I think they were. It was kind of a lukewarm result. Um, but I also think Finland is such a happy country, anyways. Like yeah. it's um, to. I don't. I don't know. Uh, it's really interesting to see where this will go because another thing. Um, to consider with Finland is like what are the restrictions for starting a business or something mm. like it because I know I know Finland isn't like the best country in the world to start a business um, so if universal basic income is tested in a sit in a country where it's easy like super easy to be an entrepreneur would that make any difference would people be more likely to start a business rather than go find a job so right. you know I'm not really sure. Uh, I think there's there's more to look at at all of these results, um, but it's yeah. interesting that we actually have a major country testing this out. Yeah. Well, I know another job or another country that has the best situation as far as jobs. It's I think it's either Sweden or Switzerland. I can't remember which one, but they have a system where most people actually don't go to college. They go to trade school. So mm. when you go through a, you know, after you finish high school, you can decide to go to trade school, which, you know, it could be becoming a doctor, it could be becoming a lawyer, those are all considered trades, or you could be a metal worker, maybe you're a very specific type of mechanic, 
and it basically funnels people into the jobs that are actually needed by the economy and mm -hmm. it, it promises higher pay and a guaranteed pay because you know hey these are the jobs that are really in demand right now yeah. and if you're not someone who loves school and just loves learning for learning's sake you're probably going to have a lot better outcome if you just go to one of these one of these trades and oh by the way based on your exams these are the ones that we think would be the best fit for you mm -hmm. that has been really successful and if you look at how that's different from america in america it's like well yeah everyone goes to higher education but no one really thinks about like what's in demand in the economy they just or think, what will be in demand when you finish school exactly I mean, there is such an overabundance of elementary school teachers in this country. Like, that's why the salary for teachers is so low. Because the supply is so high. Yeah. So if we can just make, create a better match between what's needed from employers and what's provided. And look, not everyone has to go to the same four-year basic education. You know, it's a... It's, uh, I think we can be a lot more targeted in our education and as far as the best case scenario as far as progress and what laws get passed in this country I think the proper order of events is as follows step one universal health care I think until we figure out health care I don't even think we should talk about anything else let's just figure out health care <laughs> and then once everyone realizes that they don't have to worry about th themselves dying or becoming mm -hmm. bankrupt at every moment of the day, then yeah. I think we move on to the proper taxing of corporations compared to individuals. And mm -hmm. we got to be careful here because we don't want to make it so bad for companies that they end up moving away. So I think Yeah, the business will be started either way. It would be better if they were in this country right you know, that, so we know, have to still be competitive right uh -huh. but we need to care about the individual as well because most of the new profits are going to the corporations not the individuals so first step would be pretty much reverse the tax cuts that the GOP passed like you know this last year I mean that would be like yeah anyway I mean it was it was relatively good for the economy like I don't I don't yeah, Don't but the effects have already been uh, praising Trump, but but the effects have already been been uh, become obviated, like they're no longer okay. having any impact. Was the, was the latest that I've read about it? Really? Okay. But anyways, step one: healthcare. Step two: taxes and the proper tax incentives. Step three, I would say, is an internet-based free higher education system. Yes. So we've talked about this before, but imagine if you had like um, the Khan Academy, but for every American, no matter what yeah. discipline you wanted to study with the best professors or like masterclass, like imagine you yeah. just have all of the best professors on video and it's free for anyone who wants to learn. Maybe, you know, even if you're not American, anyone in the world can learn this stuff and then we'll have yeah. way more people who are qualified for the jobs we need. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's kind of a thing already. Any... Any te a lot of teachers use Khan Academy as like a reverse classroom, yeah, which is yeah. really cool. So they'll so they'll have the students look at lectures, watch these videos of Khan and everyone, anyone you know that's doing lectures at um, on the website, and then in class they'll just work through problems together. And the teachers there kind of as a tutor and a mentor rather than standing up there lecturing. And that just fundamentally changes the relationship the teacher has to the students also. Right. Well, plus everyone learns at different speeds. So to be yeah. able to pause a YouTube video, think about it, rewind, try the yeah. problem, to be able to look at it while you're commuting, while you're doing other stuff, while you're lazy on your couch, like uh -huh. it's just much more suited to the 21st century. Yep. I mean, I, th I think that's a huge trend that we'll see going forward. And that's, I mean, that's scary for some math teachers, especially maybe mediocre math teachers that um, at the high school level, especially if you can offload the lectures to a world-class lecturer. I mean, there, there are some 
people that say that you know con lectures could be better but for the most part they're pretty good you can see how everything flows together and there's a very nice progression of how you can work through right. math problems especially well also because it it uh it's founded on the principle of a tree of knowledge so it yeah. really starts at the trunk and then it goes out into the branches and then finally the leaves so mm -hmm. the way that it's organized is great and if we could organize our education system in a similar way where people all start out with the same trunk but depending on your capabilities and your interest and what's needed in the economy you get funneled into various branches of expertise but mm -hmm. you have enough knowledge that you can transition between branches as the economy changes because as we know we're going to have to change our careers multiple mm -hmm. times and, and evolve because it's just such a fast changing economy yeah and that's um that's one of the things too that i was thinking about for the best case is having the education system to where people can transition and learn people are taught more about what it's like to be a generalist so yeah. you know one of the things that i truly think would help is if people for you know this isn't necessarily true for everybody but i think i think the more people understand like software development and at least to code a little bit i think even english majors would benefit from being able to program because they can they can run like in-depth analyses on like the language being used by a certain author like you can yeah you, you don't have to write that much code to automate some like data collection like scraping websites and doing research and right. figuring out like what the the most common phrases and what the sentiment of all of these uh, different websites and um, articles are like yeah it, I just think it would be um, really cool if people that aren't software developers kind of learned what what it's like to you know write a script and just yeah. do a do a thing that isn't even you know you wouldn't think that you can just write software for like yeah. one of the um in in my research group in grad school it's it's a computational biology group but there, that means there's some biologists that um what you know there's one biologist who's just like he's a he's a really big generalist so he like also knows how to program but most of them have no idea how to like write a little script that'll scrape all yeah. the data from all the websites that just it gets all the data whereas right now they're manually like pointing and clicking this data right. like downloading it unzipping it all of this stuff that takes several hours when you can just write a script that'll do it in a few seconds well it's interesting you say that because in the McKinsey report the number one job that's going to be hardest hit by automation are data entry processors so mm -hmm. these are people that are literally, they're in their cubicles. They may as well have the same blinders on that horses have so they don't get distracted. <laughs> they're like punching in numbers into a database. And, uh -huh. oh, no, I don't know how the database works. Oh, you want me to query something? Oh, I have no idea. I'm just a <laughs> simple monkey that gets fed this information and then I type it in. And it's like, how have we come to this part of the 21st century where people only know how to do their narrow task I mean, compare this to when we were running around on the savannas, you know, f mm -hmm. foraging for all different kinds of blueberries while hunting animals, while fending off warring tribes, while knowing the whole topography of the landscape and knowing how to care for the sick and how to raise, you know, we, mm -hmm. we knew so much more back then that I think we need to return to the generalist mindset. Yeah. And, and, and even if you have, even if you have like one area where you're, you're a master, cool like that's awesome like we need professors we need these yeah. we need experts but that doesn't mean that everything else has to suffer completely yeah. like you can still yeah. have a little bit of a, dro a broad mindset where you understand something a little bit of something from a whole bunch of different domains because ha i mean getting to understand this is something that uh, tim ferris talks a lot about is the um 80 20 principle right and it's it's way easier than you think to understand roughly 80% of something with, you know, 20% of the work. So if you're trying to learn something new, you can learn the first 80% of that field 
relatively quickly. It's mm-hmm. just when you get into the like 95, 99% when you're trying to read research papers that are totally incomprehensible to the lay person. Yeah. Uh, like I don't uh, care what your job is in a company. If you're in a tech company or any sort of 21st century company, you should know the difference between a front end and a back end. You should know <laughs> how your various like in a very yeah. basic sense how your database is organized. You should know those things. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess the best case scenario as far as education is concerned, education should never stop. Like, it doesn't stop in college. We're always learning. So if we had some sort of tree of knowledge that even if you have made it to a particular branch and that's your current area of expertise, as the needs of the economy changes and your own personal interests change, you can then continue learning to learn a different branch, to learn different leaves, whatever that is. And then if as a government, we can deal with healthcare first, then having the proper tax incentives, then having a free internet-based higher education that goes throughout your whole life, and then finally having some sort of UBI to replace the welfare system, which is so easy to game and which actually disincentivizes people to work hard because then they lose their unemployment checks. I think if we do it in this uh, in this series, mm-hmm. then we will have fantastic results as a nation and we will reestablish ourselves as the innovative country of the next century. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with that. And just being able to, letting people, because it's not necessarily the individual's fault that they can't learn a broad set of skills. It, it's kind of how the system is set up as a whole. People that have these data entry jobs, for example, they don't have any time. I mean, it's a soul-crushing job just yeah. <laughs> entering data. And then if when they're not working to learn more about databases, like I can't imagine how <laughs> how terrible that would be. Yeah. I'm sure they just want to go home and you know watch Netflix or something. Like that's, well, that, that's <laughs> I feel the, like I would want to do that. I mean, that's the beauty of working at a startup or working – as your own, at your own startup, if you're an mm-hmm. entrepreneur, is that you learn so much more early on. I mean, this mm-hmm. was advice that someone gave to me when I graduated college. They said, look, you could go work at a big company right away, but that's just going to teach you a very specific, narrow task and getting really good at becoming that specific cog and that specific machine. But if instead you work at a startup, you get to wear so many different hats and you'll learn so much. You'll learn what, you're, what you like, you'll learn what you're good at, and then you can decide what's the right, more narrow area of focus for me. And then you can become an expert and have a cushy gig at a big company. So I think for anyone listening to this podcast, if you're thinking about either starting your own company or joining a startup, I would highly recommend that early in your career because you learn so much more and that generalist mindset is going to be much more valuable in the choose yourself era of post automation. Yeah. And, and there's, there's a whole bunch of other ways too, to be a generalist. And I think that's, that's a theme that we're, that both of us really agree with is you need to have a broad set of knowledge if you want to be able to stay competitive, especially when all of this, these automation, tools take place because i mean even software developers aren't safe in the long term data scientists aren't necessarily safe in the long term and um all of these these sexy jobs that you know are being complete are being filled by everyone and their brother or try you know everyone in their brother is trying to be a data scientist for example just because that's been you know a hot job for the last three years because of ai and stuff but um well, it really it, should be based on what you are truly find passionate, what you're truly yeah, passionate yeah. about. Mm-hmm. Because I think, in, in, I mean, nowadays with the long tail, which is another concept, which basically means that nowadays you can reach any group of narrow interests, like someone who has like, I don't know, like a big toe fetish for a <laughs> Bigfoot. <laughs> like, I don't know. I'm just thinking of a crazy <laughs> example. But any subset of interests out there, you can find someone. So like another example from this one person, million dollar businesses, was this guy who was a jujitsu master. And mm-hmm. he was just like a jujitsu coach who made, you know, 12 bucks an hour teaching jujitsu to kids and didn't have a whole lot ahead of him. But he loved jujitsu. So he then started filming himself teaching jujitsu. 
and he ended up creating a whole online course of how to do self-defense. And he started marketing it. He created a website. He created a subscription video package where for just a small monthly payment, you can learn self-defense and you can be your own superhero. And, <laughs> and then this guy now has a multi-million dollar passive business that's run yeah. by one person. And so the key, it's not about what is like the most advantageous area. I mean, you should definitely consider that, but it's mostly about what are you passionate about and then finding ways to make that a reality. Yeah. Couldn't like, have said it better. I, like I love, I love this one quote where this guy says, you know, there's no shortcuts to success, but nowadays everything feels kind of shortcutty because because the tools <laughs> yeah. are so much better so it's like yeah you got to still do the work but it's a lot easier than it used to be yeah so i mean some aspects of the work are just you know they happen to be automated right. so the, the right. same work is being done it's just sometimes you don't have to see all the work which is really nice yeah all right well let's get into the most likely scenario most likely scenario Yeah, so I think the most likely scenario, um, like we say a lot, it it's going. I think it's going to get a lot worse. I, I mean, I I don't necessarily trust that the government is set up in a way to, you know, hit hit the healthcare thing correctly, mm -hmm. or even even relatively soon. Like so many things will have to be broken before the U.S. especially reforms healthcare. Um, and, I mean, it is a completely broken system, yet the only solution is to throw more duct tape and more Band-Aids onto it, which is it's really frustrating to, to see from the outside. Um, yeah. I know I know that it's it's a complicated problem. Like, I, I don't want to downplay it. Like, it, it, it should be a super easy issue because um, there are so many peripheral things that need to be fixed too, like the whole incentive structure and the whole far like the whole lobbyist and pharmaceutical structure right, right. in Washington. Um, but I think, I think eventually we will fix that. Like there's, there's going to be no, there's going to be uh, no incentive for people to even live in the U S anymore with, if healthcare costs just continue to skyrocket. Um, like the U S won't be the place that people go. And if people start moving elsewhere in the world and other countries take advantage of better education systems and take advantage of or they can pass policies that makes uh, businesses want to move to these new countries, then I think the U.S. will just see the writing on the wall and eventually take the steps they need to take to keep people in the U.S. Um, and how does that tie in with automation? So, okay, so I think uh, with when um, the way I was getting to this is that after uh, the U.S., like that's going to be the tipping point for the U.S. to like pass these these laws that make it easier for people to, let's say there's a universal basic income and it makes um, health care, universal health care thing, and it reforms education. Um, so it's going to be like this, it'll have to be this broad policy change to um, make sure people can actually do what they want to do to learn all of these different fields and be a generalist rather than, um, you know, be a, a, a super narrow uh, a, specialist. Yeah, specialist. Um, so, yeah, basically, I'm just hoping that once once these changes take place, then people can actually learn to be the generalist and um, learn about the automation tools, start a business that they want to start and give people the freedom to do so. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's, that's basically, I think it'll get worse before it gets better. Yeah. Yeah. So, so for my most likely, so just to remind, so my worst case scenario was basically the pendulum swinging too far in the direction of trying to give everyone everything and then that leading to a disincentivized sort of workforce who are not the generalists like we've been talking about. I guess my most likely scenario is that it takes a long time for the pendulum to swing and that the pendulum moves painfully slow 
And I think, you know, that's informed by, if you look at how the sausage actually gets made in politics, like for instance, look at the Affordable Care Act, which was a huge, uh, a huge step in the progress mm. of our nation. But if you look at how it actually got done, they brought all of the big pharma um, stakeholders mm. into the room and they compromised. They came up with something that, you know, wasn't exactly what the progressives wanted. It wasn't exactly what the big pharma wanted. It wasn't exactly what the GOP wanted, but it was something that they could all live with. And then that's what we ended up with. So my most likely scenario is something very similar to that, where we end up with something that's sort of an okay solution. And it doesn't shift things seismically so that we have a horrible economy or a vastly improved economy. And mm -hmm. because of that, it doesn't shift the way that we teach students or the way that students think about the job market for some amount of time. So if you think about someone who's going into college today, they are thinking about th their thinking is probably at least 10 years outdated as far as what what's going to be needed in the workforce. So mm -hmm. uh, my most likely scenario is similar to yours in that the pendulum is going to swing slowly and painfully and it's going to be tough for students as a whole and for the workforce as a whole to adapt. But that mm -hmm. doesn't mean that individuals can't capitalize on these opportunities. Anyone who's listening to this podcast, anyone who's re read James Altucher's book, Choose Yourself, anyone who sort of has seen the signs of what's to come, yep. these people will be able to capitalize on the opportunities and yep. create a better society. Awesome. Well, do you have any final thoughts or do you think we should end it there? Yeah. I mean, I would just say learn, learn more broadly. Like if, if you're listening to podcasts that are only one field, for example, or if you're list, if you're only reading books from one specific niche, maybe extend that a little bit, extend your, especially, I think, um, you know, software developers, stay only software developers and don't learn anything besides software. They don't learn about psychology a lot of times or, um, or graphic design or, or yeah, or graphic design. If you know, especially if you're a backend developer and you don't have to deal with user experience at all. Um, I just think it's, it's very beneficial to think more generally about things. Cause I think the really what innovation is, is when you, combine two different fields into one or two different ideas from like different fields into one. Yeah. And that's, um, I read this book called the Medici effect where basically this, I forgot who the author was. I read it a long time ago, but he, um, was making the point that anything, any sort of innovation is really just this, this intersection between two different ideas. Mm -hmm. And if you can think broadly and have your ideas cross pollinating in your, in the back of your mind all the time, eventually it'll seem like you just have this eureka moment of a great idea. But in reality, I mean, you, you just have this understanding of several different fields and your mind will just make those connections for you eventually. Yeah. And there really is an idea muscle. The more you practice coming up with ideas, the more easily they will come to you. So this is another thing James Altucher talks about, but if you can think of 10 ideas per day, they could be about anything. They could be ideas for what English should do about Brexit. They could be ideas for what your, you know, a podcast that your friend could start. It could be anything. It doesn't have, and you don't even have to show it to the person that it's relevant for. The mm -hmm. important point is that you come up with new ideas every day. You practice thinking outside of the box and you get away from the mentality of a horse with blinders in its cubicle, just doing the task that it's focused on. And if yeah. you're going to procrastinate during the workday, spend that procrastination time well. Don't just yeah. like, you know, watch your favorite show for the 15th time. Listen to a podcast on something you know nothing about but have been interested in maybe since you were a kid. Yeah. Focus on what you're passionate about. We are all gathered here today to talk about. All right. Well, this has been the future of automation. Thank you. We're going to talk about what has happened, in. what is currently happening, and what will inevitably happen. The past, the present.
Present.